Shopping and Business Law Department of uh, Bologna University. And today I'm truly glad uh, to welcome uh, the international conference uh, uh, titled Emerging Platform Society. Our department uh, strongly believes uh, in international projects uh, like the NIVO and the IITK uh, Research Group. Uh, as these activities uh, give us a chance to collaborate with foreign institutions uh, such as the Indian Institute of uh, Technology uh, in uh, Kanpur in, uh, in India. They represent uh, uh, um, an important opportunity to broaden um, sustainable scientific and civic uh, horizons and to host uh, uh, esteemed personalities uh, such as uh, Daniel Miller, uh, Today. Um, and all the lecturers uh, we will see in the next three days, uh, to whom we are very thankful uh, again for their availability and the interest in, in, the interest in participating in this uh, important conference. Um, the, topic, uh, the topics uh, that we, uh, we discussed uh, together in the conference will concern uh, digital consumption, uh, digital money, media, and uh, related physical and digital uh, phenomena that are all of high interest uh, uh, as well as crucial in uh, current times. So uh, we are very uh, excited to host uh, uh, different debates uh, uh, here in our department. Um, and all the ideas uh, that will emerge uh, during uh, the event and during the, the discussions. So, um, with, you know, with this said, uh, we are very looking forward uh, to the International Conference Lectures and uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Professor Sir Giorgio De Fossi for the introduction to the conference. And um, I just... Uh, I appreciate uh, once again the presence of Daniel Miller here today. Uh, I was standing in front of the camera. Thank you very much, Claudia, for the kind introduction and uh, for the institutional greetings. Hi, everybody. I just want like uh, to introduce you our project, uh, Unimo IITK Digital Sociology Research Group, which is basically a blended research group between here University of Bologna and the Kampur Indian Institute of Technology. This conference is organized by our group, which is represented by me, Pia Giorgio de Lisposti in the University of Bologna and by Professor Gilles Salasen uh, in the University of Kampur. She is online at the moment. Hi Gilles, if you would like to say some greetings, feel free to jump in. For those who don't know us, I will briefly introduce with few uh, sentences what uh, we are doing. This project consists of an academic cross-cultural team that aims to investigate different aspects of emerging platform society with a specific focus on physical digital transformation. In other words, our focus is to deepen the study of hybridization phenomena in the context of transition, while opening the debate to a wider public, also thanks to an open access website as well as some international event like the conference we are hosting today. If you want to check our activity, it's enough you Google Unibo IITK, we are the first result on Google. The URL is kind of complex, but uh, we will share during the conference. As briefly Luis mentioned, this conference is an elder in blended modality. Therefore, I want to thank both the presence of online participants as well as you that are here in presence with us. Now, moving on the first day of our institutional conference, we could not imagine a better start than having Professor Daniel Miller here with us, that truly represent another value to the event. Now, I leave the floor to you, Daniel. I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good morning uh, here and also uh, yeah, to people in, in uh, Kanpur. Um, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I am delighted to be here. Um, and the main topic that we're concerned with uh, over the next few days are platforms. And nobody, in a sense, has the right to determine the meaning of a word. 
So we have to recognise that the word platform uh, maybe have a more technical meaning in certain uh, parts of sociology. Also, it's a, a general term that people, people use. Um, so there are approaches emerging, so a very influential book about the platform society um, and concerns with its implications for the sort of ecology of platforms, with the corporations, how it reflects wider values in society. Um, but more generally, I think the term has come to be used within considerations for digital uh, almost as synonymous with kind of apps. Um, that effectively uh, people say, oh, we have all these different platforms, they mean effectively we have all these different apps. And that colloquial use is also interesting. Um, and that it implies that although there are digital platforms, that we all knew that even before the digital, um, we could understand uh, the world through something analogous to the digital platform. There were platforms before the digital. And the perspective that we are hoping to bring, myself and Shereen Morton is here with us, um, is really an anthropological perspective that complements the more, if you like, top-down concern with like the corporations and, and those kind of influences with what you might think of as a bottom-up, in the sense of it is primarily concerned with experience, with what are the ultimate consequences of all of this for the lives of the people that we uh, work with. Because for us, that's what matters, right? Ultimately, what difference does it make to the people you see all around you? And our aim is to focus upon that and make sure that that is a consideration within the overall approach to this. So let me um, start, however, with an acknowledgement that this is a collaboration between Italy and India. Um, because, as it happens, um, I had previously worked, before the digital, um, uh, I had a couple of books that actually were based in India, and one of those books was about an Indian garment called the Sari. Um, and one of the things that we noticed, because we were investigating the sun, so we had many beautiful fabrics and colours, it's not what we were concerned with. We were concerned with the sari as a platform. And in particular, what difference did that platform make to the experience of Indian women? And the contrast I will draw, because the first, I am actually wearing the first slide, okay? Um, as it happens, most of my shirts come from a shop in India, they're called Tap India, because uh, I like their shirts. But I am wearing a typical male garment, the shirt. And once I put it on in the morning and decided to give this lecture with that shirt, I am stuck with it, right? That's it as a platform. It's fixed. Um, and that, even if I go to a different environment where I would have preferred to have a different shirt, I don't have a different shirt, right? This is the platform for the day and affects my experience. Now, the interesting thing about the sari in India is that that is not the case, because the sari go, has a part of the sari goes over the shoulder, it's called the palu. And because it has the palu, an Indian woman can use her garment in all sorts of creative and different ways during the course of the day. Um, she, can, uh, she can show something by whether she's pinned it or not pinned it, uh, confidence in the way that it falls on the shoulder. She can use it, um, if she's Muslim, to, to veil herself um, in front of strangers, or if she's Hindu, to veil herself in front of older male relatives. She can clasp it and show she's being clear as a teacher. Um, she can use it in office politics. Um, there are so many ways in which that garment can be utilised as a platform that makes it a completely different platform from this shirt. So the, the already, before we even get to the digital, we can see that when we use the word platform, it's a base. But that base has different consequences depending on the nature of that base. And exactly the same would be true when we come to the digital, when we try to do this consideration of apps. 
So on my phone, I have uh, an app that tells me what stars I am looking at at night. I have an app that listens to bird song and tells me what the species of the bird is that I am listening to. I love these apps, but that's all they do. Right? They are, if you like, like my show. They're, they're there, they're given, that's the app. On the other hand, the world of apps concludes things that, that actually of themselves have multiple possibilities and uses. Perhaps the most, uh, the other end of the spectrum would be the Chinese app, um, WeChat, which can basically do almost anything um, from you know, ordering your dinner, to seeing the doctor, to having your conversations, to playing games, or actually within the app. So that's more, if you like, a Asari platform um, that actually can be manipulated according to the particular circumstances that you are in. And our concern is that, not just that there are these key differences within what we are calling the platform, but they have consequences. Now, our research has been based on an appreciation that in a way, we're already moved beyond the consideration of things like social media, because in effect, we now live in a world where what we once called social media and now we really use a bunch of apps, and they are apps in juxtaposition with other apps. And the reason for that is our primary point of access is the smartphone. So actually, in whatever other platforms we are considering, it will be strange not to also investigate the fundamental platform, which is the smartphone itself, and the consequences that has for the configuration of all the other apps. And one of the reasons it's so important is literally the physical juxtaposition. If you have a whole lot of apps and they're a, a button from each other, a centimeter, that has consequences for one's understanding of the app. Um, for example, uh, it means that when we, when we were doing our research in, in, in our book, The Global Smartphone, on a sector such as health, um, we found that the temptation when you are studying platforms is to be focused on the world according to platforms. Um, and so if you're coming out of communication and internet studies, you tend to think in terms of these platforms. But we think in terms of people's lives. And the difference that having the smartphone as the ultimate platform here is made is that actually when we then look at how people use these things, um, they actually are not thinking about apps as platforms to the degree that we might have imagined. Because they are so close to each other, um, for them it's easy to just go from one to another. So actually, people are more concerned with their tasks, the things they want to achieve, right? So in health, they may want to organize, um, organize something to do with an illness they have, but that will include dealing with the insurance, um, looking up the symptoms, um, finding an appointment with the doctor. Um, and actually, because of that, they will shift from app to app to app and configure them according to their tasks, so what they are aiming to do that they actually need which means that their conception of the things is much less app in the sense of platform based because it's been superseded by smartphone as the platform base, which allows them to amalgamate these and quickly shift, you know, looking something up and the next button is, oh, then I make an appointment and the next button is, in that case, I have to sort out insurance. And a lot of the older people we deal with don't even necessarily know the proper way. So they may think, oh, I've got to send something for insurance. I'll use my camera, and then I'll um, copy that into something else, and I will know, you know, because they find a, a, a workaround. And in the end, they, they manage to send to the insurance company what the insurance company wants. But it wasn't the way the insurance company planned it to be. So the insurance company app would have led them to do it a different way. But they don't care. What they care about is getting the money back 
for what they what they were doing, right? So they will develop their own configuration around these different apps. But they can do so because they have a smartphone. So for us, it made sense to move the agenda a bit and say, actually, maybe what we really need to be focused on right now is understanding what the hell is the smartphone. Um, and that is not a straightforward question. Because as you start to investigate this beast, um, two things follow. One, is it a phone? And B, so two, is it smart? Um, well, um, it's not really a phone. I mean, a phone was something you know, we used to use to speak to people. Um, and today, so a young person, I doubt 5%, 20th of their usage is anything like a phone, right? 95% is all sorts of other things that you couldn't do with a phone. So calling it a phone really doesn't help. It's not a phone. It, it can be a phone amongst many other things, but it's not a phone. Um, more interesting is it's smart. Because the term smart tends to imply um, a world, I mean, originally it's an acronym that talked about you know, how you get feedback so that the, the, the device itself is learning. Um, from the way it's being used. And now we are fixated on you know, algorithms, and artificial intelligence, and all the things these things can do. But our job is to look at what ordinary people actively do. And um, yes, it's true when you use your smartphone, it may predict what you are looking up or learn from what you looked up. But to be honest, in terms of the overall study of what this is used for, these are not major characteristics. Maybe they will be one day, but actually that is not at the core of our relationship with smartphone. So despite all the things about algorithms and they are greatly important in the construction of the thing, um, they're not necessarily the right thing to focus on. So if it's not a phone and it's not a smart, what is it? Um, our argument is that, as with the summary, what is important is understanding how people transform this in consumption, in usage. Because what is unprecedented about this device is the degree to which it's transformable by its users. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, because when we had done all our study, we had to try and think, well, of all the things you could say a smartphone is, what maybe is the single most important for really getting people to start thinking about this actively instead of taking it from terminologies like platforms? Um, and we decided that the, the, the most important thing about understanding a smartphone is to understand that it is a place within which we now live. It's a platform for life and that is analogous with a home. Um, and just as in a bricks and mortar home, um, we understand it as a place from which many different activities can take place, but also it's the place where we actually are. So, to turn to the slide, the smartphone is a transport home because it's um, also a portal that takes you to other people's smartphone homes um, as one of its main kind of functions. Um, we might be uh, entertaining ourselves, playing a game, catching up on the news, students doing your research through the, through the phone, gossiping with your friends, thinking about your network, or just doing functions, organising your diary, calendar, and day. Right? These, it's not a phone, it's these things that people are doing with this device and that dominate the usage of that device. So that's what it is. Okay? Um, but it's also, as I say, it's a place. Where can I find you? I actually don't even know whether you're at your physical home or not. I don't actually care because I just want to find you. I know you're at home 
if your phone rings when I contact you, send you a WhatsApp or whatever it is. Um, it's understood as a place. And it's not just us who think of it that way. We were intrigued as we were doing our research by the degree to which people in the different field sites where we work um, also use phraseology. So they would talk about um, cleaning their phone, um, like housekeeping, um, the, you know, or reorganizing, because too much rubbish is accumulating and you need to get rid of it in order that it's a, a, a cleaner space. Um, I'm here in Italy where people have a good aesthetic of space, uh, which we're very impressed by. And we can imagine that also could occur within the way they think about the aesthetic of their smartphone home. Um, so this actually was from um, Yaoundé, which is the capital of Cameroon in West Africa. And people were talking about uh, you know, cleaning the contacts, cleaning the street. But my favourite quote was somebody who said, Do you know, I am not going to let that person into my home again. But he meant the smartphone, right? not the place where he was living. So for us, um, the, the platform analogy for the smartphone is fundamentally the home, the platform from which we live. Because if we were to think predictively of all the platforms from which we carry out life, the home is clearly of conspicuous importance. Um, so this gives us, I think, a starting point for really thinking about the smartphone um, as a platform for life. Um, now, all of the things I'm talking about are based on a research project. Um, it's a research project that was called the Anthropology, ASSA, the Anthropology of Smartphones and Smart Aging. Um, it took place between 2017 and will end uh, in October this year. And we carried out, um, all the people in the team did the traditional ethnographic anthropology. That is to say, we, we lived in communities for 16 months. Um, and actually, this afternoon, you'll get a sense of the richness of that. Because um, we also published monographs. Um, such as this one, Amy's Life in Italy, which you even talked about, and she will give you a sense of the depth that you gain from carrying out that kind of 16 month research. I am more concerned, if you like, with the breadth of what you gain um, from having multiple such field sites around the world. Um, and these included uh, Gert in Japan, in China. We have a team working in our goods in Jerusalem. Um, I just mentioned the, the Yonder study in Cameroon, Patrick. We have one in the very easiest way to keep the middle class in Yonder. Um, John Hawkins is working with, with much lower income people in Kampala and Uganda. And then we have Brazil, Chile. Um, and I'm current, uh, my own study, the job study in Ireland, and I'm currently working in Trinidad, which I may not well get to. Um, so um, we, we conceptualize this project. Um, Holistically, because that's what anthropologists do, they kind of study everything, but we were concentrating in particular on three areas. Um, why were we interested in aging? The reason was that when I first started on comparable studies, working on social media in about 2012, um, it's hard to believe now, but I promise you, everybody told me that social media would never ever be used by anybody over 40. It was never going to happen and these phones would never be used by people over 40. I mean, it was absolutely sure. Um, as we now know, um, and our, I mean, our book starts, I think, with an 80-year-old Japanese flower major for whom it's just so integral to everything going on in life, it's already unimaginable to live without it. And the point then is that um, it stopped then being a youth technology, and so much of the literature about things like social media had been fixated on not just youth, but often attitudes to youth. So you know, social media was called narcissistic, so older people could tell younger people they're narcissistic, right? Um, but that came back to bite them because they were then using these things, right? And they didn't necessarily want to be themselves as narcissistic. So it's really the first opportunity to see this as everybody's platform for life. 
Um, and we were interested in how that would shift, it, shift the perceptions we have um, on this from the more narrow constraints of thinking of strangers to youth. Um, obviously, along with what is the smartphone itself? And we wanted them to, um, I may not be able to talk about this today, but we also have got a, a lot of interest in the practical outcomes of our studies. And we have a whole series of health-based initiatives that we are actually engaging in interventions to actually um, improve people's welfare and health. Uh, that is the like, final part of it. And these things um, intersect in many ways. So for example, um, recently, with, if you look at middle life, care and surveillance, um, one of the effects of, of COVID has been the, um, the development of those track and trace technologies. And what they, sh what they showed with these track and trace technologies is A, the capacity of the smartphone for surveillance. Um, think of the extreme ways this is done at the moment in China. Um, and we talked about surveillance society, but boy, do you see it when they're actually um, using track and trace technologies, but also for care. Um, because a lot of our work, as I'll come to it, was actually about how the smartphone is, is used for care. And again, um, this was a, the same Chinese government would say, yes, it's surveillance, but it is also an expression of the way the paternalistic government cares for you. Um, and therefore, they really demonstrated the, the, the importance of understanding how the smartphone could also express certain, say, contradictions or balances in this case between things like care. So those are the kind of issues um, that, are, that were likely to come up in our work and did. Um, the background then would be an understanding of transformations in ageing. Very briefly, um, what we would argue is that ageing itself has radically transformed, and the smartphone is a player in this, because um, in a generation ago, age was seen much more in terms of cultural categories. So, for example, in our Palestinian site, um, still today, people of a certain age, maybe around 50, they, they shave what they wear, they expect to be treated as seniors with wisdom, and you know, they, have, they have become a different category of person as a result of the age they have reached. Whereas in several sites, including uh, where I work in Ireland, that's basically gone. Um, people kept saying to me, oh, I thought, it, be different when I became 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, but nothing happened. All I see is continuity. And at, you know, I'm, I'm in my 70s and on Spotify and playing the music of the 70s. Um, and, um, and nobody regards me now anymore as senior with wisdom. They just are interested in my opinion because I've got an opinion, right? Um, so there's more sense equality around it. So the cultural configuration of aging had been replaced by essentially a continuity of age until frailty. And the key point is then frailty. That, that as one gets older, there start to be things that you cannot comfortably or cannot do, and that then does have significant impacts. And the smartphone was important in this because, in a way, it, it did the same thing, but almost with a little bit more violence. Because um, initially, for older people, who weren't necessarily comfortable in using smartphones, um, the smartphone became an object of what we call the digital divide. Um, and you had this ridiculous thing of the governments can, you know, attacking people for the amount of they're using smartphones, saying this is not good for you, you know, it's anti-social or whatever, and at the same time putting everything online so you couldn't actually access services unless you are using it, something like a smartphone, right? Um, and that was oppressive to the people who were thereby excluded. However, um, and one of the things we did in our field work, several of us actually taught smartphone courses to other people so you could see the way they kind of struggled with smartphones, etc. Um, but we were um, then interested that if they then, as a result of those classes or whatever, were enabled to have a smartphone, it actually did quite the opposite which had actually brought them back into that trajectory where they think, well, I'm still basically the same as when I was young, doing now the same things that the young are doing, etc., um, with their Spotify, etc. So um, it, it, there is an underlying transformation of society going on, but it's also a specific impact of smartphones upon that trajectory, as will be true of many of the things that we are studying. Um, 
Now, I mentioned earlier that the, maybe the most, uh, the most interesting thing about the smartphone is the way it can be transformed by its users. So then you investigate the consequences of that. And we come up with another, if you like, theoretical term, not transport from home, but we also have something called beyond anthropomorphism. Because what we realize is that the smartphone has a capacity to be integrated into the character of a person in a way that is probably unprecedented. Um, so, for example, in my hour field site, I would be working with a woman who is a, a consummate professional. Well, at least that's how she saw herself. You know, that she had it, she never quite got the job she thought was um, aligned with her abilities in that respect. But her phone, my phone, I mean, once you started looking at it, um, to pay her, her electricity bill, there was you know, it links into websites and the calendar and these long series of notes about all the stages that are involved, and they are all kind of linked together. It's like a, a 600 life manual in which everything is precisely organized around her life. But it's all expressed. Couldn't express it as fully as she liked in her work, she expressed it most fully in her smartphone. Compared to um, um, a man I was dealing with who had a, a particular kind of masculinity, which is, you know, a sort of minimalist, um, the, oh, what is all this stuff? You know, do we really have to use it? Um, no, 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 for me it's just, uh, I, I, I phone and I text, actually before. So as soon as they, his daughter was no longer in Australia, he wiped Skype off his phone. So the phone then becomes something which is expressive of persons, and if you look at the chapter in the book, equally of relationships, because the reason the wife doesn't have it on her phone is that's what the husband does, and vice versa. So the gender understandings of um, couples gets reflected in this. And of course, in turn, that reflects cultural values. Um, because even that notion of what it is to be masculine differs from society, it wouldn't it would be different maybe in the Philippines or somewhere else. So um, we are looking at the way the phone is um, not just expressive, but actually becomes the capacity of a person, if you like, to be themselves, uh, or be that couple, or be exemplary of the cultural values that they actually inhabit. Um, it's called beyond anthropomorphism um, because uh, a smartphone doesn't have legs and arms and doesn't look much like a person. Right? So it's a different way of understanding um, that expressiveness than, say, a robot might. Um, and um, we have a, a chapter in the global smartphone really about this kind of expressive capacity of the smartphone. So again, platform for life. Right? It is the way people now create, if you like, a, not just a mirror, but a mirror with amazing capacities to become who they then are. Um, um, a third example is uh, of the way we not just change in ourselves, but change in our relationship to the world around us, um, we theorize as perpetual opportunism. Now, previous to this, there was the idea that the mobile phone exhibited perpetual contact. You, one of the consequence of having a mobile phone is you could always be in contact with somebody else wherever you are. But we actually argue that this is, is much more than that. Um, the, once you have a smartphone in your pocket, you're always aware of the capacities that you now possess, and that can be opportunistic. So you pass a notice about a rock concert you want to go to, and you take a photo of the notice there and then um, to remember later on, um, and put it in your calendar when you get home or whatever. Um, you, you pass a, an interesting looking scene. Um, there's a clicking in the bus stop. And you think, that's funny. You take a picture then and there, and you can share it instantly with the other people who are going to find it funny. Um, your baby is smiling for the first time, and there are, again, 10 people who just have to see it right there. Okay? So this is, in a sense, an attitude to the world, um, an understanding of the, the 
way you can relate to the environment around you that is essentially constructed around that conception of who you are and what you can do and be, again, that is transformed as a result of having a smartphone. So we live now in this state of perpetual opportunism because it's always with us and we can always do these things, which is a significant difference, I would argue. Um, the point about the global smartphone is it's on the one hand has these very specific studies, and again, as you read, we'll talk to that more this afternoon, um, but also we were looking at these various generalities, which is probably um, the main things I have to speak about, but I'll, I'll give you a couple more. Um, for sociologists and others um, interested in, uh, in, in things like the, the nature of family um, and the historical trajectory around what families are, um, we would argue, based on our evidence, that it's different from each uh, field site, that historically, as a big generalization in sociology or elsewhere, you can see that in many societies we have shifted from a more extended family towards a more nuclear family. That traditionally people may have had a wider environment with their cousins, aunts, uncles, etc., etc., and that was assumed to be integral to the way we conceptualized and lived in families. Um, but now, for example, housing presupposes the nuclear, and actually um, we had also transformed. Generally, not everybody, but more towards that. Whereas, um, with, uh, with the smartphone, um, particularly when you get developments around things like uh, WhatsApp, you can be re-engaged with wider groups. And actually, when, for example, I was looking at the, the WhatsApp groups that people had, most people have family WhatsApps, and most people have extended family. And the reason that changes the nature of family is that if in a, say in a nuclear family, you see your relatives at Christmas, but it becomes a relatively form, you know, you haven't seen them for a long time, and even the way you speak to them is relatively form because it's not a continual relationship. Whereas if they're on WhatsApp and you're, you know, WhatsApping back and forth during the course of the year, it becomes that much more informal. Um, relationship that, that actually makes the experience of family that much different. Um, final one. One of the things we argue, and it came actually from the earlier study on social media, it's a big generalization, is that this transforms as a platform um, the nature of conversation itself. And the argument is that previously there were simply two way modes of conversation. There it was uh, oral, I'm speaking to you. There was textual, you're reading this. Um, but that with the rise of social media, the visual becomes not just a form of communication, but it can become conversational. So a popular app in you know, where I am is Snapchat. And Snapchat is literally photo conversation. Because you don't, you can actually, with your friend at school, send pictures of your face feeling happy or proud or whatever, all day long, without any words and any text, and it's a conversation. So the, the way the vision is used, now, the, I've used many generalizations, but actually what was important to us is that these vary from each of our individual field sites. So this idea of, um, of visual communication, um, yeah, um, will be different in a place like Japan, because Japan has a specific historical tradition of the use of the visual, um, in which they have you know, manga and the development of the emoji, etc. It's going to be different than how this plays to a society that doesn't have those traditions in the use of the visual. And in uh, Lord Hapio's work, um, she, she was looking at um, there, whereas we have WhatsApp and China has WeChat, 
In Japan, the dominant app is called Line. And um, people are sending unbelievable numbers of stickers uh, day to day. And the kind of things that she was examining in this was the way people use these to extend care. So how somebody would communicate with their grandparents. And then how that expression of care not only plays into the historical traditions of using visual, but also conversation has etiquette around it. Um, actually, we talk about face-to-face -face as though it was more natural. It really isn't, right? We know from Goffman and then on that it's surrounded by a thicket of conventions, what we can say and what we can't say. Um, and in Japan is a society where there is a tremendous amount of etiquette around the way you perform yourself in conversation. So when you have a new medium, um, it, one of the things that's important about it is not just that it's visual, but also that it's new. So that means that you can actually use it possibly to get around some of these etiquettes or express them in a different way. And that changes the relationship between uh, between different groups of people. So, what I've kind of concentrated on today is really the, the, the headline, as it were, of the global smartphone. I the more general uh, claims that we would make. And as you can see, when I say platform of life, um, I really mean it. Because we've gone from, you know, the way you relate to the outer world, the way you relate to yourself, the way you relate to your relationships, um, the way it becomes the place in which you live. Um, I think platform of life is no exaggeration when you can consider all those different elements. But I ended um, with an argument which says that actually all of this depends upon the specific place that you did your study. Um, and because I'm going to take questions, I'm going to, to sort of end there. But the point of making to end there is that there is a, a balance, a complementarity between what I have been saying and what Jureen will be talking about, because um, one of our sites happens to be in Italy. And actually, um, when you go from these broad generalizations to the specifics of a pop set of populations in a place, then actually um, you come up with a whole lot of other um, understandings um, and ethnographic uh, uh, results about the consequences this has for people that are much better understood in a particular place. Um, and that's why I haven't talked so much about this myself, but that you will talk about this afternoon. And I want to stop there because I want to make sure there's time for questions. Thank you. Daniel for your engaging presentation. Now we have question time, so if someone wish to jump in with some question, feel free to ask. And then meanwhile, I have a first question. So if I look polite, but uh, uh, I find a lot of uh, very interesting uh, instance in your talk. And uh, since my main topic of research is uh, presumption and basically the idea that the uh, consumer, or uh, it's way better to say presumer, are uh, engaging a double relationship with the social context. So they are both enabled and exploited by situation and context. And moreover, with platforms, I find your idea of the smartphone as a place and a house very engaging. But at the same time, I, I would like to ask you if, uh, by some extent, uh, using the, the same metaphor, none of us is owner in, in the global digital society of our own. I mean, all of us are renting our apartment from uh, Apple, Google, and those main platforms ruling uh, the, the digital environment. That, of course, we can customize a lot, but uh, on the other end, we can have like an idea of a Bavarian 2.0 in which uh, these places, I mean, these digital homes are also Digital, digital cage as well as there was uh, the iron cage in the classical modern I mean, society. I would like your insight about that. 
Yes, I think that if you draw an analogy between a smartphone and a home, it should be realistic about a home. Now, um, a home, traditional bricks and mortar home, was always a cage. Um, you ask a teenager in their home, right, um, who is under the control of their parents. They have barricaded their room. Parents keep out, right? Um, because you look at a home where there is conflict between, uh, between husband and wife, okay? And where that happens in the home, and what is witnessed and not witnessed in relation to those children. Um, you look at the people who have a disability related to mobility, and they can't leave them. And you look at lockdown during COVID, where we all felt caged in by our homes, um, and were desperate in some way to get out of it. So I don't think that the idea of an analogy with home precludes the things that you are concerned with. Because also in a home, we may be paying a mortgage, which we may not be able to afford. And right now, mortgage rates are about to go up, and we didn't reckon that we'd go up as much as they are about to go up, right? So suddenly that changes our, our finances, etc. So um, I think the question you've asked actually reinforces the point about thinking about this, this analogy and how effective it is. Because actually, um, a platform for life includes all that life is for good and for bad, and to the degree to which predictably we were uh, under the influence of the political economy isn't changed by the fact that we are engaged in smartphones. It's maybe slightly different political economies, and there are many writers about the surveillance society, etc., that are looking at those differences. Having said all that, I still think there is something about the way we are doing the research that I would be insistent on, which is the place where I started, which is the trouble is if you start from the other end and you're focused entirely on the corporations, the neoliberal capitalism, the elements of control, you tend sometimes to draw from that and project onto people um, in terms of what matters to them and the consequences to them. And we are very insistent that there has to be something else. It is not my authority, because I think this element of the corporation is important, to then say that's what matters to people on the street out there. We have to have that humility, I think, that doesn't allow us simply to project onto people what matters to us in our debates. Um, we also have to have the respect that says, do you know, I will go out there and see. And it may be that something of what you're talking about people care about, and there may be other members that you don't care about at all. And if they don't care about it, and we cannot demonstrate it has consequences, it's not consequential. And so for us, it is always vital to say, hold on, I don't know. I have to find out through empathetic engagement with people how they understand the consequences of all this. Because otherwise, we just don't know the consequences. Thank you very much. Any other question from the floor on the virtual classroom? Please tell us where. Come on, boy. Se ti sentono bene per il giorno di azionato, però se vai davanti ti chiedi mai. Come? Preferisci. Ok, thanks Daniel for your uh, terrific talk and I really appreciate this uh, humility that you have in order to try to understand beyond the stereotype, the prejudice, the categories, or what is the life of objects, like in this case. So talking about OMA, uh, you mentioned the COVID situation, and I was thinking about that. We usually think that we stay safe at home. What about about homeless or just vulnerable categories? I'm thinking, for example, about some categories like migrants, refugees. I mean, escaping or living abroad, the form is even more a home. Mm -hmm. So can you confirm this I about will. that? And just a couple of questions. And I really appreciate also this idea of uh, uh, seeing the, the, the smartphone as home because it goes 
beyond the prejudice of alienation, isolation, you say maybe even you can be more in touch with your relatives or whatever. So uh, it's also a critique to these uh, popular critiques towards the alienation of the smartphone. Uh, and so how do you, uh, do you relate the idea of care and surveillance, care and control to this kind of critique? And then the last is about methodology. I mean, what kind of methodology do you use to investigate? Okay. So I'll give you three questions. For the first one, I was happy to hear this question about migrants, but Shireen was even happier because actually the talk this afternoon is going to be about migrants um, and how they experience the smartphone because that was the main population in Milan which she works with. So she will give a much longer and better answer than, than I can do now. Um, the second question, we'll go to the third question about methodology very briefly. Um, one of the reasons we are very insistent upon working on this as anthropologists is because quite often in other disciplines, the main medium of methodology is language, um, and or surveys, or interviews. And the problem there is that um, people have a discourse about smartphones. If I ask somebody in the street, tell me about the smartphone, they will talk about uh, surveillance, and they will talk, they know from the newspapers what to talk about, right? Um, they will talk about addiction, they will talk about all these things. Um, but if you, so, so these are important because they are, they are a property of the, a property of the smartphone is the way the smartphone is used as a discourse, which is actually about discussing moral issues in society. That's what that discourse is really about, it's got phone from the smartphone. It has to do with how they exploit the smartphone in moral debates about youth, about all these things. And we have a chat with the local smartphone, uh, the discourse about the smartphone. But if you actually want to see what is really happening with the smartphone, um, the, the main method that most of us were using was to say that um, there is a huge discrepancy between what people say and what they do. Mostly, particularly older people, if I ask them about the smartphone, what do you do with your smartphone? They say, nah, not much. I have maybe two things I mainly do, texting and, and, and Twitter, right? So what we did, we are there for 16 months, and we try and use that time to get the trust of people so they are familiar with us and comfortable with us. And then at a certain point, I would go to them and say, okay, I would like to look at your phone, and I would like to discuss every single app on your phone, one by one. Now, a survey wouldn't have done, because half the apps on their phone they don't even use. They did once, they didn't like it, because it's there or their kids put it on when they were visiting, etc. So there is no other way of understanding this, I think, except going through every single app, one by one, developing stories, you know, when did you last use it, what happened, often like health stories, when they were ill, da da da, da etc, etc. And also, of course, watching them. Um, partly by participation, being on their WhatsApp groups and being on their Facebook, etc., communicating with them, using it together to go shopping, um, etc. But I think what's fundamental is that you don't understand a smartphone unless you do it at that level of detail. Because what they say about it, so those people, the same people who said I do two things, texting and phones, after we had finished going through the phone, typically there was only people using 25 to 30 different only two of them can mention it. So, surveys, no. Um, even if you said, then survey the apps, half and half people. It just doesn't work. I can't see it that you can do anything other than what you did. Okay, which is, which is that very, very detailed investigation. But it must be based on trust. They've got to be comfortable with you, that they will start telling you very private things that's going on in there. So this is a very private device. And that's why we have our 16-month relationship in order to, to investigate. Third element of your uh, question um, was really about theory. And particularly, um, you were using um, a terminology, I would say, that originates in Marx, which effectively is a terminology that we constantly use um, because Marx was concerned effectively with the ruptures created by the, uh, by the conditions of capitalism, and particularly there are three tropes of vestiges of reification 
question, but in the sense then grow into other ways in which we theorize a sense of production. Um, my first sort of main book um, to study these things, a book called Two Accounts of Mass Consumption, in which I argued why um, the way these have come down to us from Marx are problematic, and actually it was better to go to what I would see as the original Hegelian formulation of these ideas about the concept of objectification. And the difference between Hegel and Marx is that Hegel understood the condition of safe alienation as a necessary condition, but one that was usually overcome through the process actually of consumption. Um, so we encounter something in the shop as a symbol of, say, capitalism. Um, it's fully alienated, as it were, and, um, and doesn't necessarily represent the labor. But then, in the process of consumption, it becomes something that you know, a shirt we've worn three times um, is now very much ours and becomes a form of inalienability. And I think that the, uh, not necessarily in a good way, it can be um, all sorts of problems that occur around those processes of consumption comes into these issues of process of consumption. But I do think that, um, I, I, mean, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but I do think the theorization of these relationships um, to my mind, for all sorts of reasons, start better from Hegel than they do from Marx. Um, because I think uh, Hegel and, and other theorists like Zimmel, etc., saw the contradictions and actually saw also how people strive to overcome contradictions. Whereas for me, Marx and constant literature are flatter. They really focus on, on rupture um, and get kind of almost fixed there. And I don't I think that's much less true to our actual engagement with. But that's if you want the details of that in the book called Material Cut and Mass Consumption, but that's kind of the gist of, of where I would be in relation to that kind of terminology. Thank you very much. Other questions on the virtual class? Yeah, Laura, some Zoom questions. So, Gillette, if you want to ask questions, turn on your microphone. Please, the floor is yours. So maybe in the meantime for Dieter. Dieter, can you turn on your microphone for your question if you want? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, am I here? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, fine, great. great. Um, yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to uh, to listen to your talk. Uh, when I started uh, with, uh, with some research on consumption issues in the 90s, uh, I came across your book edition, Acknowledging Consumption, uh, so very soon after its uh, publication. So since then, I know your name, and I'm happy to uh, have heard your talk now here, because uh, your, your presentation on, on smartphones and consumption um, gives insight into a very new world of digital communication. Uh, I mean, so new. It, it may not be anymore, of course, uh, but, but it, it, it's really a new world of non-face-to-face -face communication. And uh, I think the previous question and also your answer, Daniel, is very interesting regarding with refugees, migration, and so on. Uh, the, 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 the nature of migration has changed extremely due to the availability of smartphones uh, because people are not when they migrate are not so separated from their uh, home families anymore through the availability of, of electronic uh, communication. Uh, I, I, have an, I have a very specific different question um, related to a long project or publication I'm, I'm, I'm just preparing, um, which is on, um, on internet communication or smartphone communication and, and that presence by small business owners. Um, the question is, I mean, uh, regular communication on smartphones is, wise, is mostly, let's say, reciprocal between sender and recipient. It is mostly uh, a halfway democratic way. But um, communication and internet presence by business owners is just um, to arrive potential customers. And they want to tell stories, they want to orchestrate narratives um, to, in order to give a positive image um, to write 
people and, and, and to maintain traffic on their, on their website. So the rationality is different um, because, um, because the platform activity is always at least partially of instrumental nature. Uh, have, have you any, any ideas about this kind of, 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 of smartphone communication and internet presence um, as a tool for business owners, uh, whatever, to, to come into contact with potential customers? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, okay, well, first of all, as I said, I mean, Shereen is the expert on migration, so, and, 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 the, and this is a really important element. I will agree with you with that. With regard, I mean, I am, I have worked myself and I, and I have uh, PhD students who are working on the development of e-commerce. And in a way, um, the picture that you just presented reflects, in some respects, I would say, a more traditional conceptualization of the relationship between business and customers. Because prior to the internet, if you think about marketing, it was, largely speaking, this kind of one-way um, relationship that you had the brand or whatever it is you were trying to sell, and you put things out there in the hope that it would have this kind of consequence for consumers. I would have said, though, that while that may still be true for some small businesses, what we're finding in our work is that the, the, one of the most important consequences of things like uh, internet and smartphones is that actually the situation becomes more fluid. I mean, obviously, one of the terms being used in this workshop, consumption, in part deals with that because sometimes it's done it's now quite unclear as to who is the consumer and who is the producer. And um, a lot of the, the business, small businesses we're working on in China, for example, um, would be in that situation that actually um, there is uh, a, a more, I would say, it's, it's not as um, it's not as separated in the way that people, that people tend to know more about who they're dealing with. And, more personal set of interactions that also are then used instrumentally for business but don't have such a clear boundary as traditional businesses did. And also that actually um, a lot of these uh, elements are also used for kind of feedback, that actually there are ways of evaluation um, what you did in your marketing. There is information you can gain and, and I think even most small businesses now today would want to exploit the possibilities of the internet or having that uh, loot relationship, which is not so much actually one way. Um, and then you get, of course, um, sometimes the, the, uh, the you know, if you think about it's like a trip advisor or something, um, and how that has affected every business in the hospitality world, right? That, um, you know, that, that actually the traditional forms of marketing have been, to some extent, rendered redundant because actually the overwhelming force is the evaluation, not that they try to engage with, but that it's coming at them anyway, because people will say whether the meal was good, the hotel was good, etc., etc. So I would have thought that actually there are many profound implications in these changes, and they make for, um, and that's why I'm, I'm happy with words like consumption, because I think they actually do represent this more complex, this more fluid, this more plural, varied set of relationships between business. Having said all that, I would actually recognise that there is also some continuity. There will be small businesses that will be in exactly the situation you described, where effectively um, this is simply a new media for old marketing. Yeah. So Gillette, did you want to add Yeah, we have Gillette, if yes. she can talk, and then we have also Melissa here in the room. Hi, Danny. Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to do this face-to-face, uh, -face kind of. Uh, I really appreciated how you started your talk with uh, the question of what exactly are platforms and, you know, using the smartphone as a way to sort of enter into that examination. Um, I had a slightly different question and in some ways um, it goes back to this, uh, the, the the diversity that you created between the smartphone and the app slash the platform. Um, I wonder if, as part of you know this really multi-sided uh, research that you've been looking at, whether you saw any continuity between the use of smartphones and feature tools. I bring this up because 
in India, for instance, uh, there are many app makers now who are trying to incorporate a lot of the apps and features that you will see in smartphones, for instance, WhatsApp or other forms of digital money, into the feature, feature phones themselves. So that's happening at the level of these companies. But on the other hand, uh, you know, for instance, uh, something I'm going to be discussing in my talk tomorrow, we also came across particularly elderly users who would often use a combination of the smartphone and the feature phone. So smartphone to interact with the app uh, and the feature phone to interact with the people. So I'm just curious what you got from this. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, okay, so during this particular, I mean, our previous project, the one on social media, where Hugh and Ben Katya was working in Chennai, mm -hmm. we had an Indian-based study. This one we didn't, but the place where the feature phone features uh, most would actually be in our study in Japan, because different regions have different trajectories of phones. And the one where the feature phone probably was most important was actually in Japan, because there was a time when Japan was in the vanguard. And they produced what is locally called a Garake, which is kind of in between mobiles. It's a, it's a feature phone, basically. And it came to dominate the Japanese market. So now then there's a question, what would be the relationship between the feature phone and the smartphone? And actually, um, there's a, a, a something that will, will come out as a book by uh, Laura Hapier Kirk, which has a lot of detailed discussions of all the workers in Japan. And what he found, which I think speaks to the talk I just gave, is there are technological questions in terms of what a, what a smartphone can do that a feature phone can't do. But actually, almost more important than that is really what I talked about when I talked about beyond anthropomorphism, because what the phone speaks to as almost an embodiment of the person. And um, I don't have time for all the details, but one of the things he argues is that um, the difference between feature phones and smartphones is mainly crucial in Japan because of the way it reflects gender relations. And the reason for that is that the feature phone became very involved in the world of work and, and a very male sense of their relationship to work and a question of whether they retain that during retirement, etc. Um, whereas women were more focused on things like social connectivities and possibilities. And therefore, what's happened in, in Japan is basically men have tried to hold on to Garakes and women have gone for smartphones. Um, and it becomes quite an important reflection of the dynamics of gender relations in that. Now, there is no reason at all why that has to bear any relation to what's going on in India. But, uh, but I think it, it, it's a point, though, because I think what it shows is that the, the whatever differences we're concerned with, in this case between feature phones and uh, smartphones, lend themselves to symbolic distinctions, which may be embedded in gender, age, or all sorts of other parameters. And then it's very much an empirical question. I mean, I would love to know from you how that has played out in the Indian context, and that will then be interesting to compare to the Japanese context. Um, but I would only be able to do that when we know from you what, what the Indian situation is. Um, but, uh, but it's certainly something that comes into our work, yes. Okay. Melissa? Yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. And I was very fascinated by this possibility of smartphones to influence uh, care. And uh, because I just read the Care Manifesto by the Care Collective, uh, where they talk about community of care and promiscuous care, so I was wondering also, because you presented the, the bright side of it, but I was wondering which are the, the dark sides. Uh, I, I was thinking, for example, about the individualization or the excessive responsibility on families and relatives, or also about the fact that uh, they can also reduce and shrink the trust uh, in the care system. Uh, for example, I have some symptoms and I go on the phone and I try to have a self-diagnosis about uh, my illness, right? So I, uh, I was simply wondering about this. Thank I you. mean, I, I think there's, um, there's an even deeper problem with care, which comes out from a sensitivity to the situation of care even before we even get to the issue. And that is, I'm, we tend to deal with older people. And one of the issues that comes up in so many of the different places we work is about autonomy and dignity. 
that basically the problem for older people, I mean, it, what the English will say all the time is, I don't want to be a burden. Um, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I know they want to care for me, but I, you know, I lose dignity, I lose my sense of myself, I lose so many things. So care is negative in that respect, fundamentally, before we even get to this, or at least it's contradictory. Um, but, obviously, necessary. So you start, I, I think, really, from, from that kind of contradiction. And then you look at the way the new technologies play into this. Um, and since you asked for a negative example, I will give you one. Um, I just finished a paper about, and it's not really care, but I think it will do, um, about the consequences of Googling for health information. Now, there's probably nothing with greater consequence uh, and, and, and more ubiquitous than the fact that everybody Googles health information, okay? So then the question is, what's the effect of that? And the paper I've written, we have a, a book that will be coming out about, because I, I didn't talk about the paper that time, about the health work that you do. So it's about, on, on M, or M health, right, if you know that. So, um, the point that comes out of ethnography is often these things have consequences you never really thought about. And the particular consequence that I was concerned with about Googling for health in Ireland was the um, impact it has on class relations. Okay? Why class relations? The reason is because what I found was that if you look at that society, um, there are people who've got a degree, good education, confident in their use of research. Um, and by and large, when those people Google health information, they know which things not to look at, right? They may even, let's say they've done a degree, as many people have today, they would know even to go through and find the academic papers upon which the information was based. I know people that would do that, okay? I would do that. Um, and by and large, that improves their understanding of their health condition. So those who are already, in a sense, um, near the top in terms of, of, of um, uh, the, the way they can understand health information, their knowledge has improved. If you go down the other end of the scale, and you have people that didn't have that research capabilities or experience, they just go on Google. And the tendency then, particularly I think before COVID, was they would come across sites that either related to commercial interest or anxiety. Because the things that the media tend to promote are things that cause anxiety, because that promotes media. Newspapers do that. And similarly with Google. So everything means you're going to get cancer. Um, and everything is, is catastrophic, etc. And, it, and um, the more they looked at, the more they were told you know, all sorts of weird things that they should or shouldn't be doing in relation to these symptoms. And they would become, generally speaking, more anxious, more confused, less clear about what the hell was going on. And so the people who, as it were, had more got more, and the people who had less got less. Um, and that is what my paper is about, is the way Google for Health exacerbates class differences which I never occurred to me until I did the study. So yes, I think that when it comes to things like care, um, one has to be alert to both the fundamentals and contradictions, like not wanting to be a burden and respect for autonomy, and then how that gets affected by these new possibilities of online. I mean, I, I have a much longer answer that would also look at how it affects the relationship to doctors, consultants, because I also study that. But, um, but the point is, yes, they're related. Uh, I have time to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, well, thank you very much, Daniel. We will be As in the best Italian tradition, we have a short delay. So we do apologize for that. We are glad to host you downstairs for a short coffee break. And we will start at the second session at 11.45. But before that, uh, I would address a big thank to um, Laura Tiamassi, Paolo Giglio, and Desiree Florian 
without their help, this event would have been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one last thing, in case anybody isn't here this afternoon. Um, the books that we're talking about, um, I have them here, but also, just to let you know, they are free, they are online, all you have to do is go to UCL Press, and they are no cost, and you have them for free. Um, if you wanted print copies, you would pay for, and I have, we have print copies.